<clears throat> okay, so I worked out <clears throat> through age 12, age 13, age 14, um, very hard. It, it was like, uh, it, was, it was my whole life. I got everybody in my grade school to work out. We, I was like uh, an evangelist for working out. I went to my first bodybuilding contest and saw this fellow, Bill Sino. He was, uh, he was about 22 or 23. But remember, if I'm 13 at this time, 23 feels like, you know, another world. If you're 13 and you're with a 23-year-old. And he was just a monster. He was so strong and, and such a nice man. As I understand, I've Googled him, and I think he's a, a high school football coach um, as a career. Then I met this fellow named Sergio Oliva. He became known in bodybuilding as the myth. He, had, he was from Cuba. He was a professional Olympic weightlifter, and he defected from communist Cuba and moved to Chicago. And when I met him, he didn't, it was at his very first posing exhibition. He hardly spoke any English. He had a translator. Um, and he could not have been nicer um, to us boys. I was with a few friends, and we were about, like I say, 13 years old. <clears throat> and Sergio went on. He, he became a, uh, a beloved Chicago policeman. Um, in bodybuilding, he was known as the myth because nobody could beat him. Nobody could touch him. Now, originally, there were two factions in bodybuilding, the AAU and the IFBB. And the AAU was the Amateur Athletic Union, and they promoted weightlifting with bodybuilding as an afterthought. The Weeder brothers, Joe and Ben Weeder, promoted bodybuilding first. And the AAU in, in that time was accused of racism, especially in the, uh, in the kinds of sports where it's subjective, like where you have to evaluate who has the most muscle or who looks the best or whatever. It's not who can lift the most. And um, when he entered the Mr. America contest in Chicago in 1964, which I attended, um, I think he was placed seventh or eighth, which was ridiculous. He, was, he should have been first. So uh, he left the AAU, joined the IFBB, and won Mr. America, Mr. Universe, Mr. Olympia. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, his big goal was to topple Sergio Oliva because it, was, it just wasn't considered possible. And Arnold, uh, the first time they competed, lost. And then, but he was a very smart guy. He analyzed what Sergio did right, what he did wrong, and he kept training hard. And and eventually overtook him, and Arnold became Arnold. Uh, but Sergio was up at that level, and I met him like when in his very first posing exhibition. And like I say, he couldn't have been nicer. Um, as as time went on, I remember um, like my eighth grade graduation present was my dad gave me a membership to Triumph Gym for the summer. So every day I would take the L downtown and work out at Triumph Gym. I met another kid about my age named Rocky. I don't know whatever happened to him, but he was really a, a nice guy. And we worked out hard together. And then we'd go down to this $1.19 steakhouse and have steak and garlic toast and uh, baked potato and green beans or a salad. And, they, and I just felt like such a big guy, you know, lifting weights and getting blood flowing through my system and and um, because remember I, would, I I forgot to say I was very small to begin with um, and that's one of the reasons I think people become bodybuilders I remember talking to a fellow who's a psychiatrist who was a big bodybuilder and a great guy um, at the old world gym we were standing outside and I said why do you think people become competitive bodybuilders and he said I think it's overcompensation they start out small and they want to get big um, he said I don't think it's an accident that Arnold's father was a police chief, and Lou Ferrigno's father was, a, was in the police, and they want to measure up, you know, and get big. Um, and that, that made a lot of sense to me. I remember, um, well, just training hard and enjoying this and having surrounding, I created a home gym down in the basement of, of my parents' house, and this is what I was living for. But as I got older, what happened was I lost control of my schedule. Um, I, I, oh, I know. I wanted to go to, to high school downtown Chicago because that way I could work out of Triumph Gym. And my mother was an Italian Catholic, and there's no way that she would let me go to any school in downtown Chicago unless there was a religious reason. Well, I found out there was a seminary called Quigley North. So I said, oh, I'll, I'll become a priest. So, that, so I went downtown every day 
so I could go to Triumph Gym and see Rock Stonewall every afternoon. The problem was at Quigley, you know, I was on the swimming team and the rest, we did wrestling, we did soccer, we did track, baseball, and so I didn't, I couldn't do that. I wasn't allowed to. I was only, you know, 14, 15. And that was very, very frustrating. Um, the summer of 1965, the whole, my mom took all eight kids to France, and we, we were in Cap Ferret, which is at the very south of France, about an hour south of Bordeaux. And I did a lot of freehand exercises and went to the beach and tanned a lot, but uh, there, there was no gym, no way for me to lift weights. So I would just read these muscle magazines and, and dream of what I wanted to do. Then we come back to suburban Chicago, and I transferred to Loyola Academy in Wilmette. I went there, I remember, uh, the, my frustration was I was 15 years old, and I was late in, uh, in going through maturity or puberty, or, and, uh, and I was small. And here I had done all this work for so many years. And like I'd stand next to Bill Murray, the famous actor and comedian. He was a classmate. And he was, he was kind of a bully. He was, on the, he, he was probably six feet, six feet one, 175, 180 pounds, lots of muscle because he was on the football team. I was five feet tall, 105 pounds, maybe 115 if I put on extra clothes. And here I had been all, the, and so I got really discouraged. Uh, Murray was, I remember, he was very funny in high school. Um, and I didn't know him well. My, one of my best friends was Luke Matthews, and Luke and Bill were, were super close. So the extent to which Murray was a bully, Luke made sure he never bullied me. But still, I think unconsciously I was thinking, this is, this is crazy. I've done all this work, and there's no result. Even though now, if I look at pictures of myself then, I think, whoa, well, no, I really had made progress. If only somebody had looked at that and given me proper guidance, and if somehow I had been in the right environment. All right, now, then I go about my life. I, I, I you know, went to a couple of other high schools, finally got it together, um, went to college, business school, and was succeeding in business and succeeding in journalism as a reporter and editor. And then I was hired at the Los Angeles Times Syndicate. Uh, I started a family, but I wasn't working out hardly at all. And I remember thinking as I was like around 30, you know what, I had this dream to look like that fellow, his name is Guy Mirzak, he's from France, um, and, and I never did it. And you know, that's not like me, especially me as an adult. If I set a goal, I reach it. And then I set the new goal, then the new goal. And when you do that, you build a feeling of confidence. Nothing can build confidence like that. So I thought, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go back to it and really get into bodybuilding. But the problem was, I was at this point vice president, general manager of the Los Angeles Times Syndicate. I had a big job, so I couldn't just be a gym rat or you know hang out and, and experiment. So I thought, okay, I'm smart enough to figure out that I need help. And in those days, we didn't have personal trainers. This was like 1981. But I saw an ad in a, I bought a muscle magazine, and I saw an ad, one of Weeders, and the ad was by Franco Colombo, and. He said, come to me, I'm a chiropractor. Oh, this was back, I, I forgot this. <laughs> this was back when, when I was like 13 uh, years old and I got my picture and story written up uh, in a magazine. There you go.